truly delighted, Margarita, to have you with us. Uh, before I pass on to you, I should just note that you know, this talk is supported by Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And Margarita has very kindly agreed to visit us uh, in this very special period when Portugal hosts the presidency of the Council of the European Union, which of course means that Margarita is in a very special particular way feeding into uh, policy uh, within the EU when it comes to competition law and competition matters. Margarita, thank you so much for joining us. I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. I really thank you for joining us this morning and I'm also very happy to be with you. Uh, and I'd like to thank, of course, the Queen's University in Belfast and Professor Marek Martinishin uh, for the kind invitation to intervene in this, in this guest lecture at the School of Law. Um, I will. Uh, I will have some slides up, but uh, of, of course we can uh, we can uh, divert from the slides if you wish. So, uh, especially at the end of the session with with the Q and A uh, uh, moment that we will have. Uh, the focus of the session, um, if we move to to slide two, is the focus uh, is to focus on how competition policy can materialize potential growth. I will discuss the role of competition policy in the economic recovery uh, because uh, competition policy in this in this particular role can be sometimes underestimated and I will provide uh, strong examples I, I expect uh, of uh, our experience as enforcers as competition enforcers in this respect. Uh, in addition, I will address as well some of the EU's priorities and initiatives that contribute to the economic recovery, as well as to whether uh, current European priorities such as the European Green Deal and the European uh, Digital Package. Um, this, as you know, includes the much uh, famed Digital Markets Act, the DMA, and the Digital Services Act, the DSA. Uh, this, these are also particular, uh, partic particularly relevant topics that fall into the ongoing Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union, in which uh, the, the Portuguese Competition Authority, the ADC, plays uh, some role, as we'll see ahead. Um, so, uh, in slide three, um, I will uh, start with ec the economic recovery and competition. Uh, we know, of course, that we are living in unprecedented times. Uh, this crisis resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic has been a major economic shock. This crisis, this, uh, crisis is never like the, 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 the one before or the ones before, and this, again, has unique and severe features, uh, not least because of its cross-sector and, and global nature, um, if we look back to exactly one year ago, no one could have expected the, the economic upheaval that was going to take place throughout the remainder of 2020 and, and beyond. We've seen record quarterly declines in GDP, uh, which were uh, led by disruptions in supply uh, and a sharp decrease in consumption of in-person services in particular. Some of these sectors uh, include hospitality management, transportation, restaurants, in-person recreation. So to give you just a, 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 some data, for example, in air travel in Europe, uh, we saw a 90% decline last April uh, compared to the previous year, while it's still down 73% when compared now to last year. Uh, so, at a time when countries are really focused uh, on developing strategies that can help recover their economies from this major shock, the discussion regarding the role of competition policy is more relevant than ever. Uh, so, uh, if we move to slide four, from the competition enforcers perspective, this recovery effort uh, has two dimensions that you know well, uh, competition advocacy and competition enforcer, enforcement. And in both of them, uh, I will argue that we need more competition, not less. So, uh, starting uh, uh, to have this to to, uh, to start to start this discussion on slide five, I will, I will argue that recovery efforts do not necessarily mean financial support. Of course, we 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 uh, 
uh, see this in the news and discuss this uh, extensively, how much financial support is needed. But uh, actually, recovery efforts can be of a very different nature, uh, and, uh, and that includes in what competition policy is concerned, uh, reform that allows and may allow full, uh, fully for companies and individuals to innovate and demonstrate their unique skills. So my first point is that for the recovery to be as ample as possible, competition policy must be at its core. On the competition advocacy side, as I was mentioning, this means adopting uh, reform or changes that unleash the, the productivity growth potential embedded in our economies. Unnecessary barriers to competition, uh, unnecessary barriers to productivity growth and to innovation can be found, among others, in legislation for products and services, uh, but also in labor markets. Uh, and I will pause here to, to remind you that we have seen calls, uh, many calls, for relaxing competition rules, at least temporarily, but by temporarily we should, see, we should, uh, we should uh, read at least 12 to, 20, to 18 months. We will continue to see these calls, and they may seem the intuitive move to make, uh, but I will argue that we can do better if we embrace competition rules, particularly in these challenging times. So, as I was saying, we need more, not less competition, so as to ensure that we come out of this challenging process better, stronger and more resilient. At the ADC, we have avoided, like many other um, uh, competition agencies, the suspension or the mitigation of competition rules. During this time, uh, on the contrary, we really started uh, this pandemic by um, uh, having uh, a strong statement about competition rules that have been and are uh, fully in force. Um, it's hard to, to draw lessons from the past, um, given the unprecedented nature of this pandemic, but if there's anything we can still remember and we could learn from the, 20, uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis is that under enforcement is counterproductive. So I would also add that competition enforcers, uh, enforcers um, may wish to focus on sectors uh, that enable a stronger and faster recovery, uh, but uh, we need uh, more, competition enforce, uh, more competition policy, not less. On slide six, which we are already now, um, I will I would uh, emphasize that these three uh, key areas may be, but it, of course an enforcer can choose uh, others, but we at the ADC have chosen connectivity, labor markets and state intervention. These sectors have marked uh, uh, a lot of our activity in 2020 and have guided our priorities for 2021 as well. So let's look at them. First, connectivity. Um, at a time when our consumption patterns are adjusting um, or have adjusted, um, consumers uh, must not be prevented from switching from telecom providers that better match their preferences and optimize their spending in what uh, uh, these services are concerned. So to let competition fully play its part, consumers need to be effectively informed about their options and be able to switch easily uh, to alternative operators if they're not satisfied with their contractual conditions. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit specific here, but within the area of connectivity, uh, which we all depend on now, uh, we've chosen, for example, to issue an analysis in April 2020 that showed that loyalty clauses in the telecom sector create serious constraints to consumer switching. Um, this analysis also showed that prices paid uh, by uh, Portuguese consumers in communication services, especially in mobile internet services, are higher than the EU average. So this resulted in a set of recommendations uh, to the government and to the sector regulator, which aim at removing barriers to switching. Uh, for example, we recommended that consumers uh, should be able to terminate a contract uh, with the same ease and simplicity with which they can subscribe a service. If you, if you uh, subscribe a new service through the phone or online, then you should also be able to uh, 
uh, cancel this service exactly through the same means, which is not the case now. So we recommend for that easiness as well. Uh, we also recommended for a swift transposition of the EU electronic communications codes, which allows to solve some of the identified concerns. So to sum up, uh, really connectivity uh, in our daily lives today plays a key role, uh, be it in, uh, in our academic roles, professional roles, social roles. And as such, freedom of choice and of switching in the telecom sector is really critical. At the same time, we were also, uh, at least in Portugal, at, at a defining moment for improving competition in the telecom sector, and that's because of the 5G spectrum auctions uh, that will determine to a significant extent what the market will look like for the years to come. So in this respect, we uh, recommended measures to promote entry in, in, the, in, in our telecoms market, uh, for, example, uh, for example, arguing for the inclusion of 5G frequencies in the bidding stage reserved for new entrants. Now, moving to the, the other area, which is labor markets, um, we know that uh, a as a result of this crisis, uh, unemployment has or will increase significantly. Uh, and with that, we have a real risk of poverty uh, increasing uh, and inequalities widening. Uh, so we, we, in such times, we think the idea of labor flexibility is more important than ever. It was already the case, and in some countries more than other, uh, we could find more flexibility or less flexibility according to the countries. Uh, the United Kingdom being, uh, at least in my view, uh, an example of a country with uh, a lot less barriers uh, than others. Um, but we found that many, we, we conducted a, a very long, uh, long in terms of exhaustive study uh, in, in many um, self-regulated professions in which we found unnecessary barriers. Uh, underlying this uh, study was the idea that professionals need to have the opportunity to adapt to new conditions in the market that change throughout their careers, but even more now with, with this pandemic and the effects of the pandemic. And that includes having the opportunity to change careers if they wish or need to. So it is really important that the legal and regulatory framework do not create these unnecessary obstacles for workers seeking to change uh, jobs. So we have been advocating strongly. Um, it's something we started in 2018, but even more, we we're stressing this, these, um, the, this, these, uh, uh, these recommendations even more now to remove these barriers on self-regulated professions that go from lawyers, architects, engineers, but also to nutritionists and customs staff, um, we we didn't see them all, but you know, basically also many uh, regulations have uh, barriers. Some of them are justified, but some seem to be uh, a bit outdated and uh, unnecessary. We ha we were happy to see that the removal of these barriers have been uh, has been envisaged by the Portuguese government's recent recovery and resilient plan. Um, so we we are we're focusing on on taking the opportunity uh, that we have now with with uh, the pandemic and the recovery plan to see these barriers um, uh, removed as much as possible, which will make of course our economies much more resilient in the, in the in the in the future. Um, state intervention, as a last, as a last, still on on, on slide six. Um, state intervention. Um, we we see that competition agencies can and should play a role here, especially in advocating for competitive neutrality of state intervention. Uh, we uh, we we think that it's really important that enforcers warn. Uh, policymakers and decision makers about the risks of picking winners and losers, or that they raise a flag when public measures can lead to distortions of competition in the market. So the objective must be, of course, to reconcile the underlying policy goals that these decision makers have, especially those that promote economic recovery right now, while minimizing distortions to competition in the market because we know that such distortions may compromise efficiency and, and consumer welfare, both in the immediate and in the longer term. 
so in this respect, again, to give you a few examples, the ADC had uh, recent advocacy initiatives that promote competitive neutrality and state intervention. I will only name two and then uh, leave the rest for questions later if you're interested. Uh, one was advocating for technological neutrality in the payment services area. Uh, and the other was issuing an opinion on a recent government proposal to amend the public contracts code. Uh, I will only uh, refer to the fact that several policy choices made under pressure, which is the case now, can result in uh, less competitive procedures or can alter market structure uh, through the introduction of preferences or, or barriers. And those choices, even if intended to be temporary, can be stickier than anticipated in the last several years. So it is an enforcer's duty to raise awareness for competitive neutrality in states' policies. If we move to slide seven now and we, we, we go through competition enforcement, the other side, um, it's been important for, for, for enforcers, for competition enforcers to step up uh, their work in, in, in key sectors previously identified, and I will mention for the purpose of, uh, purposes of giving you some examples, again, connectivity in, in labor markets. Um, over the past 12 months, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, on the connectivity side, we have sanctioned one of the, large, uh, one of the largest telecom operators in Portugal with a, an 84 million fine for having agreed with a competitor to increase prices, uh, to reduce quality and to share markets. Um, why is this important? Because again, uh, uh, on internet services and, and therefore breaking up these cartels is extremely important um, to, to so that uh, with effect with effects now, we can have uh, a more diversity uh, of choice in, in services and, and, if possible, lower prices. And as we have seen, our study con uh, concluded that we had prices above the average in the European Union. So we broke up uh, uh, this cartel, we issued uh, uh, a sanction. Uh, both companies had made an anti-competitive agreement for fixed and mobile services after signing an MVNO agreement. I'm only talking about a fine to one of the operators application with us. Uh, in addition, in, in July last year as well, we issued a statement of objections to the four major telecom operation, operators in Portugal again for participating in a cartel where they agreed uh, not to advertise online next to each other on, on the Google search uh, engine. And this, uh, it is our preliminary conclusion that this has softened competition uh, and has uh, reduced uh, the incentives to compete and present better deals to consumers who are searching on Google search engine. Uh, Moving to labor markets, in, in May last year as well, we imposed an interim measure and ordered the, the Portuguese Professional Football League to immediately suspend a standalone no to recruit or hire other clubs football players of the first and second leagues during the pandemic. Uh, and subsequently, and shortly after this case, we came across uh, um, a proposal uh, by the Portuguese Football Federation to set a salary cap of, of the effects it might have had. Um, interestingly, the proposed measure was included in a package to deal with the financial impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on football clubs. But overall, what we need to be aware of is that in facing a crisis, firms may seek to reach agreements uh, regarding their labor force or agreements of another nature, which uh, can be um, sanctionable through competition law. These agreements regarding the labor force, uh, we found that can distort the competitive functioning of labor markets, they can reduce workers' mobility, they can reduce worker wages, and uh, I highlight mobility because 
when so many workers are unemployed or soon to be unemployed, then labor mobility, again, as I said, must be enhanced. Um, but there were other, a lot of other uh, effects that no poach agreements uh, can have that we considered um, in this, uh, in this um, uh, interim measure. Uh, and we will see uh, we will see developments uh, coming up on this uh, on this case as well. Um, so um, our duty again, as I said, as an enforcer, uh, must be to ensure that labor markets remain open and competitive um, as we seek to foster recovery uh, and employment uh, as we face the pandemic. Um, it's also worth mentioning that early uh, in, uh, in, in early last year, the ADC acknowledged that the context could trigger the need for temporary business cooperation, um, and this was uh, this was uh, important in order to prevent scarcity, for example, in the supply of essential goods or to address other market failures. And we made uh, ourselves available for individual guidance to firms. Um, this was a, a natural process uh, because these requests for informal guidance and, uh, started reaching the ADC and other competition agencies in the EU as well, uh, which led us to consider to be fair and appropriate to provide uh, guidance. Uh, we had two. Ex uh, I had two examples to to mention to you, but in 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 the interest of time, I will just name them, and if there are questions, we can address them later. And this was one. Um, guidance to the banking and financial sector, especially uh, uh, regarding um, loan, the loans moratoria, there is, which means a suspension of debt payments to be applied by, by members of the Portuguese banking and consumer credit associations. And another one was uh, with the pharmacies association uh, that I can also elaborate later if, that's inter if that interests you. Um, the main takeaway is that crisis management uh, may prompt competitors to engage in new forms of cooperation, sometimes even with the support of public authorities. This means that competition enforcers can be, of course, um, diligent in, in, in providing guidance, but they also must remain vigilant towards opportunistic behavior than, that in the end may hurt consumers and the economy. Uh, uh, contrary to 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 the the purpose that uh, was uh, underlying this this uh, agreement so as to finalize this point we came into 2021 with the following priorities one to support the economy by keeping a focus on detecting and sanctioning abuse uh, in other anti-competitive behavior that could exploit the current situation to the detriment of all of us and and uh, households and firms uh, second, to investigate signs of abuse and collusion in a digital environment. Why? Because there is a partial shift in the risk of anti-competitive behavior uh, to e-commerce, and we are all using um, online shopping a lot more than before. Um, and third, to contribute to the economic recovery by recommending the removal of legal barriers, uh, such as those that prevent um, unnecessarily professional mobility and corporate innovation. Now, uh, moving to the topic of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union on slide eight, I have been telling you that the competition enforcer uh, can do and does, uh, I've been telling you what we can do and what we do uh, so as to maintain markets open and contestable while contributing to the economic recovery. But let's now consider what the European Union is envisaging, and in particular, what the EU presidency of the Council is envisaging in the first semester. Uh, on slide nine, uh, I only uh, wish to say that the presidency is currently in this semester held by Portugal with the motto, time to deliver, a fair green and digital recovery. Uh, and on slide 10, um, I will address how exactly is the Portuguese presidency of the EU achieving this. Um, there are five lines of action uh, that have been devised to uh, drive growth in the EU, and that's a resilient Europe, a green Europe, a digital Europe, a social Europe, and a global Europe. Uh, 
We've been talking about some of these concepts, uh, but let's now address the remainder from a competition policies perspective. Um, on, I'll go directly to slide two, 12, and I will uh, first emphasize the European Green Deal. Uh, European citizens have put the environment at the top of their values. Uh, in this context, on uh, the 11th of December uh, 2019, the European Commission announced its Green Deal. Uh, the European Green Deal is a growth strategy for the EU uh, that uh, seeks to transform this, uh, this area into a climate neutral and fair and prosperous society with a modern, resource efficient and com uh, com a competitive economy. So it's really uh, an encompassing um, growth uh, strategy. Um, on slide three, uh, I, uh, 13, sorry, 13, I will also uh, say that a discussion has emerged on how competition policy can help achieve green objectives. Of course, green objectives can be dealt with through a lot of other policies. And, and while there is a general consensus that competition law is not the primary instrument to achieve green objectives, that doesn't mean competition does not have a role to play uh, in this so-called green script. Um, the discussion must then seek to strike a balance between ensuring efficiency and fair deals for consumers' future uh, while seeking to become a climate neutral economy. Uh, such a balance is being devised, taking into account three areas. One is state aid, which in my view is the preferred uh, vector uh, for this contribution to the European Green Deal. The second is horizontal agreements, and the third is merger review. I would say that we should start by demystifying views that place uh, competition policy as an obstacle to sustainability, uh, actually, I believe that in many aspects, aspects this is quite the opposite, and, and uh, we'll see how on slide 14. Um, competition uh, and innovation are generally uh, positively correlated. They tend to go hand in hand, and this is because it is contestability that induces innovation. This is also true for competition and green innovation. Uh, historically, innovation has led to significant productivity and welfare increases and to sustainability increases. Why? Um, because firms want to develop more efficient production processes. Uh, this is part uh, of what they, they're constantly seeking. And when they achieve this, it gives them a competitive advantage over rivals. Uh, more efficient production processes often mean that an important part of process innovation is green innovation. Think of the cases, for example, where uh, firms focus on spending less energy to cut down their, their, uh, their costs, uh, on reducing and using waste, on, or for example, on, on using renewable or more durable inputs. Uh, so I, I would like to make two points. One is that strong competition creates incentives to reduce costs through innovation. The second is that strong consumer demand for green products is also a strong incentive for firms to be more sustainable in their production processes and in the products and services they offer. In fact, I would argue that consumer demand is extremely powerful in driving this change and consumers are valuing sustainability more than ever. So consumers' willingness to pay for green is a powerful incentive for green innovation. And as such, keeping competition conditions strong in an effective uh, 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 competition conditions strong in this in this in this um, uh, in all markets is an effective contribution of competition policy for the European Green Deal or for Green Deal in general. Um, so again, more competition, not less, uh, is needed here. Um, but how do competition enforcers achieve this? In practice, innovation plays a key role in competition assessments. And, and we can go to slide 15 and see the case of merger control. And I will uh, mention a case that you probably know well, which is the landmark Bayer-Monsanto merger. Um, very quickly, in its assessment, 
the European Commission found product and pipeline overlaps as well as innovation capability overlaps uh, when they conducted the, the merger assessment. I will uh, mention a case that you probably know well, which is the landmark Bayer Monsanto merger. Um, very quickly in its assessment, the European Commission found product and pipeline overlaps as well as innovation capability overlaps uh, when they conducted the, the merger assessment. Uh, the, the, the assessment considered that the merger would hamper innovation competition for crop protection and seed industries. Uh, this included the development of even more environmentally friendly products. So ultimately, the European Commission considered that consumers could be harmed in the short run by a loss of product quality and variety, and in the long run by a significant loss of innovation given the incentives of the merging parties to delay, to redirect, or to discontinue innovation efforts after the merger. So this, this bolstered the debates on the role of competition in promoting innovation. Uh, there were other mergers that uh, contributed to that debate. Another message drawn by competition authorities is that they need to be vigilant of attempts by incumbents to protect their market power. Um, uh, when they acquire disruptive entrants, the, this is how they pr try to protect their, their power. Uh, and if incumbents who are lagging in terms of green innovation adopt a killer strategy uh, to prevent or to delay the introduction of green innovation to the market, they may, under certain circumstances, be halted by uh, competition enforcers. By the way, I will, I'll, I'll pause here to say that uh, the Portuguese Competition Authority has an annual competition award uh, and that this may interest you students uh, and scholars uh, who are uh, listening to us. Uh, and last year it was given, it was, the award was given to a paper by Colleen Cunningham, uh, Florian Edder and Song Ma. Uh, from different universities, the LSE, Yale, uh, and Yale, uh, precisely on killer acquisitions. So last year it was an award for uh, papers uh, in uh, competition economics, and this year uh, the competition is open to papers uh, in competition law. Um, I'll stop the pause here and, and, and uh, proceed to cooperation agreements and antitrust. In the case of cooperation agreements and antitrust still linked to the Green Deal, uh, two short points I'd like to make. Uh, one is that competition enforcers acknowledge the, that firms wish to operate in a predictable and certain environment from a legal standpoint. And two is that the debate on competition and sustainability has revived and acknowledged the flexibility provided by European law which certainly allows agreements to take place under certain circumstances. Uh, in this respect, we might need to improve our communication regarding the leeway that already exists in our competition framework regarding sustainability initiatives. In addition, it may also be important in order to balance the debates to um, avoid giving the wrong impression to consumers that competition law is opposed or is not open to agreements between firms. It is open under certain, certain circumstances. Um, I must highlight again this, uh, the, the necessary economic recovery is one in which competition enforcement and advocacy remain vigorous and strong and incentivize open and innovative markets. There's also a debate on efficiencies, namely out-of-market efficiencies that I will not address here for the sake of time and your attention. Uh, and I will move to slide 16, uh, and that's uh, uh, an, uh, to address an initiative uh, that is the European Digital Package, another initiative of the uh, of the several I mentioned uh, earlier in this presentation. We addressed the Green Deal, uh, and I will address the Digital Package now because this is um, uh, something that the European Commission considers that it was uh, there was a clear need to tackle um, because we need to ensure in the digital sectors uh, that our fundamental rights 
are uh, in competition and ultimately social and economic welfare are um, well treated in the digital uh, in the digital uh, uh, environment. So following an extensive public consultation that you may know in the summer of 2020, the European Commission proposed last December a comprehensive set of new rules for digital services. This is called the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services um, Act. Uh, these rules seek to reform the digital space in the EU, as I said, in line uh, with the European Commission uh, ambition to make this um, Europe's digital decade. So on slide 17, I will say a few words about the Digital Markets Act, uh, or the so-called DMA. The DMA aims at preventing gatekeepers from imposing unfair conditions on business users and end users, and uh, also uh, aims uh, at ensuring the openness of important digital services. And in this regard, the DMA introduces a set of rules that are only applicable to large companies designated as gatekeepers um, according to objective criteria uh, which are set in the proposal. Um, these companies are companies which are considered to have a significant impact on the internal market of the EU. Um, they serve as an important gateway for business users to reach end users and they enjoy or will foreseeably enjoy an entrenched and durable position. Um, what may interest us more as users, as citizens, as enforcers is in practice what unfair practices will the DMA tackle? Um, some examples include, uh, for example, when a provider of online intermediation services that does not allow uh, hotels uh, to offer better prices on different online travel agents uh, platforms, um, or an app store operator that unilaterally requires all app developers to integrate the app store's own user uh, ID functionality in their apps and to show this ID functionality to the customers of their apps. Uh, but there are many uh, other uh, examples. The, if I move to slide 18, in the context of the DMA proposal uh, and during the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the EU, the, the ADC, the Portuguese Competition Authority, uh, is um, gladly participating in the working party on competition in collaboration with the Portuguese permanent representation of the EU and also the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it is co-chairing the meetings of the working party on competition of the Council. Um, why are we happy? Because we think that our uh, expertise as an, an independent uh, agency uh, will contribute to um, uh, uh, a DMA which is uh, uh, strong in terms of protecting uh, competition policy. Um, this is where the discussions uh, on the DMA are taking place. Uh, the DMA negotiations started in January 2021 and is currently ongoing at the Council. If I move to slide 19, uh, and we're moving closer to the end. Besides the, the, the DMA, uh, there's also a DSA, uh, uh, which is included in the European Digital Package. Uh, this is being negotiated uh, in tandem with the DMA at the Council. Uh, the main objective of the DSA is to uh, provide better protection to consumers regarding illegal content, transparent advertising, disinformation. This, this really relates to all of us all of us who have uh, uh, dealt with the internet uh, daily for the last uh, many years. Um, so basically this will modernize the e-commerce directive which was adopted in 2000. And that seems like ancient history for what online is concerned. So there's a, there's a much need to modernize this, this directive. Uh, and according to the DSA, uh, platforms that reach more than 10% of the EU's population, that is mostly around 45 million users, are considered systemic and as such they have specific obligations. Um, I can address this later as well uh, if you wish, um, but this is a very interesting 
um, there's, it's a very interesting piece of regulation. Um, the DSA negotiation is currently ongoing, as I said, specifically at the internal market working party, not, so not the same working party as the DMA. Um, and both the DSA and DMA fall under the Competitiveness Council, which brings together the ministers responsible for trade, economy, industry, research, uh, innovation and space from the, the 27 EU member states. Um, so again, these two pieces of legislation, DMA and DSA, are expected to contribute to the European digital transformation. Final remarks and on slide 21, and I hope you're still with us. Um, we come uh, to a conclusion. Uh, I, I said that uh, during this session uh, that it was important to see how competition policy could materialize potential growth, especially in the aftermath of the global pandemic. Uh, and then in this respect, uh, uh, we are convinced that competition policy plays a very important role in proposing conditions for a more dynamic, more resilient and more competitive economy. At the same time, and particularly at the EU level, we are experiencing a transformation where digitization and sustainability are very much at its heart. Competition enforces can have an active role in ensuring a successful and fair transformation with more competition, not less, uh, in our view at least. And uh, at the EDC, our competition advocacy and enforcement uh, uh, in the past 12 months clearly show our commitment to these objectives. We all uh, we play our part at the EDC in these, uh, in these uh, overall um, EU or global objectives, but all of us uh, and all of you here today, and I mean scholars, students, other enforcers, lawyers, uh, all of us can make competition policy be heard and taken into account in public policy or in firms. And um, even with anonymous citizens, all of us need to, uh, to seize uh, the, the opportunity that all of us have a, a smaller or a bigger opportunity, but we all have this opportunity to make a difference and make competition policy be heard. Don't take competition policy achievements for granted. Uh, as we see, there are regular calls for, um, for a, a lessening competition rather than increasing competition. Ours is, as you know, a continued struggle but one that benefits us all. So with that, I will stop here uh, and move to you, Marek. Thank you so much, Margarita. That was terrific, uh, terrific presentation. And thank you for outlining both priorities of and actions uh, taken by your agency and also for working us through developments at the EU level. A lot there, clearly many challenges, interesting opportunities. You even brought in interesting uh, adjustments of the system. You know, I really like the way you related to um, more frequent use of informal guidance now to, for firms. This is something which we haven't seen a lot in the last couple of years prior to the crisis. Um, so a, a lot going on, all very exciting. Clearly, you, you are busier than ever, I would presume. So <laughs> great many thanks again for being here with us. Margarita has very kindly agreed to take some questions. So I would be very happy now to open the floor. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak up uh, and tell us who you are. Maybe I abuse my role of the chair. Please, please feel free to ask questions, raise hands, but I'll ask first question to Margarita. Uh, I have a couple of questions really. Now we'll be close to home. So uh, uh, in, in the pandemic, it seems that um, consumer becomes more visible in the framework of enforcement than ever. And we have seen quite a few cases, especially at the national level relating to exploitative pricing, especially when the pandemic started. Um, and in, in, some, in a couple of countries, agencies looking after consumer protection are the same agencies that look after competition law enforcement. And that's the case, of course, in our home jurisdiction, UK, that's the case in the Republic of Ireland following a recent merger, although that merger was um, incentivized by the bailout 
following the financial crisis. But we have similar solutions also in other EU member states, for example, my home country, Poland. I know that your agency, your brief, uh, focuses only on competition law, competition law enforcement. Would you have any views on the future of that? Are we going to see more mergers between agencies? Is competition, consumer protection better placed in a single agency? Or can we continue dealing with these issues separately? Interesting question, Marek. In the, of the four years I've, uh, I've been at the Competition Authority, uh, I would say that this is pretty much an open debate because what really matters to me is if agencies uh, do what they're expected to do. So they can be merged or they can be separate as long as they really uh, um, deliver to society in what, in what they are uh, supposed to deliver. Um, I, there can be, there can, there can be a plus in having both of, of these uh, agencies together because uh, when you um, deliver uh, something on your consumer protection side, it's very visible to consumers and they, they really see the value, uh, the immediate value of, of your agency. Whereas in competition uh, law enforcement, it may be, it may take a while. It can be technical and it can be uh, somewhat difficult to understand by the, the typical consumer. Although although cartels are pretty easy to understand, but um, sometimes it's more technical and becomes uh, a, a bit lengthier to, to tackle as well. Um, so having consumer protection on your side can can help improve your uh, your visibility with consumers. Uh, but uh, but really, I think both are extremely important. I have a lot of sympathy for consumer protection, although we're not uh, dealing directly with consumer protection. I really think we need to do both well, whether in a merged entity or not. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm, are would there be any other questions for Margarita? Yes, uh, please go ahead. Could you please identify yourself and tell us where you're from? Uh, I am from Queens itself. Mm -hmm. um, I teach economics here. Um, and um, I, I, um, I remember that um, um, that Margarita had mentioned um, that competition policy is also pro-equality. Um, I mean, in the beginning, you did say about inequality, which is one of the major uh, uh, points that uh, that is, um, I mean, um, everywhere uh, it concerns. Um, however, at the same time, you did, I mean, uh, I guess um, that there is, uh, I mean, some trade-off between competition and um, inequality. For example, you did say anti-poaching, um, um, law should be um, um, kind of uh, um, uh, abolished in some sense, right? And then uh, it, it will it will uh, it will be raising uh, as it is. We know even in academia, like I mean, the the salary of the uh, I mean, great uh, from from uh, from the president or VC uh, to the salary of uh, lower strata. We had this uh, issue of uh, union strikes. Uh, Last to last year, right? So there is this difference. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, order of magnitudes, uh, ten times or so, right? Um, so, I mean, football also. I mean, again, you say uh, anti-poaching uh, should be abolished. Then, I mean, it. I mean, as it is, I mean, you know, the star. I mean, how much they get. So, I mean, how did you put the both things together? I mean, because you, you did say that, I mean, you are concerned about inequality and then, um, so how did it come to some policy? I mean, um, what is your take on this? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's, it's also a, a wide ranging debate and one that uh, we keep having uh, regularly, if not uh, constantly. I, I could say that uh, promoting competition, from my point of view, has important benefits as well in terms of inclusiveness, for example. 
um, in terms of promoting the reduction of inequality because it offers really a lot of options. If we have competition, we don't have a single option for a consumer. We have several options if we, if we have uh, 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 a market uh, that um, uh, is functioning properly. So they, these offers can apply, can can deliver to any consumer's uh, wishes. It can be a high quality uh, and possibly a more expensive option for those who wish to have it, but they can also have a, be a good quality and much cheaper option for those who do not wish or cannot afford uh, a, a different product. Sometimes it's just a matter of wanting to to spend less uh, uh, on a given on a given product. So it is really important that you have a, a competition functioning properly, so that you have a wide range of options to cater to what you or any consumer want. Um, I would say also that some empirical studies uh, have found that there's an increase in concentration in several sectors and at the same time a reduction in the fraction of, uh, of labor in GDP. So promoting, promoting competitive market structures also promotes uh, more competitive labor markets if we wish to turn to, to labor markets and this can contribute to uh, a fair distribution or fairer distribution of value and avoiding um, a strengthening of the bargaining power of employers vis-a-vis -vis employees. But if we turn to no poach, and I wish to say this uh, because it, it's something that is still uh, at its early stages uh, in Europe in terms of competition policy. In fact, when we say no poach, people think that it's something related to hunting uh, wild animals, it's not the case, or, or endangered, endangered, endangered species, that's not the case. No poach is something that is very common, has been very common in all sectors um, in this, uh, for many years, at least I would say in Europe and beyond. Uh, but, uh, we know this has been uh, the case in, in, in banking, in IT services, in between law firms. And people didn't realize that this was not, uh, this is something that can be uh, uh, sanctioned by competition law. Uh, our effort is, is to go along that route and, and, and uh, have together with um, the potential pursuit of cases in no poach, as we see them, as we find them, as we encounter them, also have an advocacy initiative with uh, no poach on um, with different uh, business associations with uh, big firms so that they can understand what really is at stake here. I mean, some, it, it sounds like something from the past century, but uh, we found that it's still very much ingrained in our economies and one that um, that has many um, many uh, uh, negative brings many negative. Uh, uh, negatives to our to the economy. Okay, uh, I could I, I can extend a little longer uh, that debate if you uh, if you want to. Maybe I'll just turn to another question and then if there are no other questions, I I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay. Thank you so much. Do we have other questions? Emma, could you please ask it orally? We have another question from a student here at Queens. Hi, my name is Emma. I'm a student at Queen studying Competition Law. I'm just wondering, has the pandemic, you know that there's been challenges of course faced, but has there been anything that has been completely unexpected that's been raised? And do you feel now that obviously with more people being at home and the digital sector growing, has there been a heightened increase focusing on competition law in the digital market sector? Margarita, we don't hear you. You're muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Too many screens open here. <laughs> I, I was going to say, Emma, your question already has an answer and I've alluded to it, which is uh, indeed we have uh, seen 
an increased uh, shift to online markets as we were in lockdown. I mean, you, you needed to to uh, to buy everything uh, online if we, you couldn't go out and if uh, businesses were closed or ma many of them closed. So, in fact, there is a, a we saw a risk of uh, of um, uh, the the risk of collusion, for example, moved a lot more to digital markets. I know. We, we we talk about digital markets and we think about abusive dominance by dominant platforms or players, uh, but there's also a clear risk of of, uh, of collusion between um, between firms. We saw that with our statement of objections issued uh, last year uh, with the four main um, telecom uh, operators. As I said, these are st this is still a statement of objections. We'll see. How it plays uh, with, uh, of course, the, the company's responses, um, but um, but we saw that in the digital environment, companies could still collude in order to uh, bring less competition and less visibility on competitors in the digital market. Um, the use of algorithms is also something we've uh, been paying attention uh, very strongly since uh, 2019 when we started looking at the possible ways to collude uh, through algorithms and we saw that there uh, there are very there there are likely ways and 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 feasible ways in which this, this can occur and we need to be uh, up to date with that the pandemic only uh, strengthened this these risks they were already there but uh, it shifted the risk uh, to a lot of risk of collusion into the online markets and in online markets, that risk has been enhanced, generally speaking. Um, I'm not sure I, I have uh, responded to your question thoroughly. Um, uh, unexpected challenges, uh, what else? <laughs> I don't know, we always expect everything, so <laughs> we're used to that. I always expect the unexpected. That there are many. Uh, this is an unbelievable uh, world to work in because uh, we see many things uh, happening that we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have imagined, especially in the collusion front. But <laughs> but uh, I would say unexpected. But uh, if I can go back, for example, to the 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 banking moratoria. Uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with any of that, uh, uh, but it's something very much. Um, uh, that, that it's something that many uh, many um, public uh, authorities, uh, not competition authorities, but other public authorities encouraged, uh, which basically meant uh, delaying the payment on your loans for about 12 months or more. Uh, but the conditions of the loans uh, to be considered uh, were all uh, harmonized. And what we uh, argued is that um, while this um, can be uh, important for the time being, it must be short in terms of duration. Uh, it, it mustn't. It should not be there forever. Uh, as I said, these uh, initiatives tend to be uh, stickier than we think. Um, this has been. This happened 12 months ago, and we're talking about a few months more now. And then, who knows? Next year, we'll still be talking about this. So we said that this should be short in duration. It should be proportionate and. Uh, that many uh, banks that wish to have other conditions uh, on the moratoria should be free to uh, to choose their conditions um, as as they as they wish. So basically, being autonomous in their uh, in their policy, including in the moratoria policy. Um, so they shouldn't be tied to a single. Um, uh, a single position from the from all the members of the banking association and the credit association. Um, this was, you know, something that was unexpected because underlying this, there was a concern with prudential um, with prudential ratios for banks. Uh, so of course, it, it was also important to ease uh, the terms of repayment for for. for for businesses which were um, 
uh, temporarily shut down, but that was the public in, publicly imposed moratoria. Then there were moratoria which were private, basically, it wasn't necessarily the state uh, imposing them. These were uh, voluntary agreements uh, by uh, uh, sector associations, and in this case, the banking association, the credit association, uh, and we thought that uh, it should only last as long as it's really needed. Uh, it should be proportionate, it should be uh, it should let other members be free to choose other conditions if they wished so, um, and they should not use this opportunity to um, to to collude, basically. I hope that's answered. <laughs> but, and, uh, you know, th th there are always unexpected challenges, but again, uh, we continue to see uh, typical uh, behavior uh, from uh, even before the pandemic in terms of what is sanctionable. Thank you so much, Margarita. That was that was wonderful. Uh, I would not like to uh, abuse your schedule and you have been very generous with your time with us. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. You are leaving with us with a lot of good food for thought. Uh, <laughs> there's no doubt a lot of happening at the, at the moment. And uh, clearly there will be some interesting shifts in the policy and perhaps even in law. Thank you so much for being with us virtually in Belfast. I hope that after the pandemic ends, you'll be able to visit us uh, face to face. <laughs> Marek, Thank this was, pleasure was mine, and I really, really hoped I could be with all of you uh, in Belfast and, and pursue this discussion even beyond uh, the allotted time, uh, but I hope this can still happen very soon. I hope so as well. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. With Thank this, you. we are ending the talk for today. Thank you so much, all. Goodbye.